Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole, and I'm the parent support worker for the Niagara Catholic District School Board Early on Child and Family Centers. Today, we are going to be highlighting the key points from Chapter 2 called Attachment in the Early Years from Dr. Jean Clinton's book, Love Builds Brains. So, Dr. Jean introduces the topic of attachment by reminding us that an infant's desire for an adult's comfort when they are in distress or in need of protection or sick is absolutely universal. So no matter your culture, cultural or social surroundings, this fact will always remain true. And this idea that an infant needs a consistent, caring and close adult caregiver will be the foundation of today's summary. So we're going to briefly explain attachment, note how it's established within the early years, and talk about how it helps build our child's brain, all thanks to the insights made by Dr. Jean in this book. So first, a baby is literally born helpless. This becomes the mechanism that establishes the connection between an adult and a child because an infant needs that adult in order to survive. And this connection is what then leads to attachment. So what exactly is attachment? Dr. Jean refers to attachment theory and research when she says, and I quote, when babies' needs are sensitively and predictably met, they develop a secure attachment, which can lead to healthy exploration and development. End quote. So in this chapter, Dr. Jean offers a summary of the research done by Ainsworth and Bowlby that is now known as attachment theory. So that based on the way um, a baby acts when a mother leaves a room and then comes back can actually tell a lot about how securely or insecurely attached that baby is. So for instance, a securely attached infant will explore a new room knowing that mom is there as a secure base. Likewise, if the mother would leave in this experiment and then come back, the child would be soothed and comforted upon her return. Alternatively, when an infant is insecurely attached, they likely, they likely wouldn't have been soothed upon the return of that mother. They might cry excessively, they might push away or hit their mother. And as Dr. Jean summarizes, these cases of insecure attachment are often rooted in the child not having been consistently soothed by that parent in the past. So this just further emphasizes that secure attachment evolves from healthy serve and return interactions as children establish brain connections that say, okay, this person will help me survive, they're going to help me feel safe and feel loved. I'm going to quote Dr. Jean one more time here as I say, we accomplish attachment with children by giving them exclusive individual attention, lots of face-to-face -face time, and plenty of verbal stimulation. So let's talk a bit more about this attention by focusing on the connection between the adult and the child from infancy. If you'd recall, a baby is born nine months premature when we consider the development of the brain. So at birth, their brain is one-third the size of an, of an adult's. So when babies are born, the part of their brain that's developed is what we call um, a reptilian brain. It's the part of the brain that keeps us alive. It's responsible for keeping our heart rate um, or our heart beating. It is responsible for taking breaths, managing our body temperature, all of those things that keep us alive that we don't really have to think about. Now I challenge you to try and listen to this without thinking about how many breaths you're taking. Once you bring awareness, it gets a little bit tougher. But essentially, this means that babies are born with the ability to sleep, eat, and cry. And it's not really until six months of age that the section of their brain responsible for social interaction begins to develop. So Dr. Jean explains this in depth, and she does so because of this key point I'm going to share. You should never, ever ignore an infant's cry. I repeat, do not let your infants cry it out. I want to share here some reflections from my co-workers about this exact topic. For me, I'm not 
even a parent, and I've heard this concept many times before, that it's okay to um, let your baby cry in the crib. They'll learn to self-soothe. You know, my coworker has said that, um, and I'll quote her here, as a new mother, when, ba- when my babies cried, I always felt they needed something. So my first instinct was to go and pick them up. At that time, I was told to let babies cry it out, which was difficult for me to understand and it was difficult for me to do. And another one of my colleagues reflected by saying, and I quote, too often we hear the cliche that babies need to develop their lungs and that it's okay to cry. However, this chapter made me reflect on the importance of soothing a baby because they are most likely in need of something or in distress. They are in need of attention, not the opposite. I would not have fully understood this, but this chapter really opened my eyes to this, end quote. So Dr. Jean points out here that babies are incapable of manipulating us. They are not a 16-year-old manipulate, manipulating you into getting their way. When an infant is crying, it means that their stress system within the body is turned on. So as adults, we know how to regulate this stress response, right? We slow down, we take breaths, we go for a run. Babies, and even some young children, don't have the ability or brain development to do this yet. The babies need us to co-regulate as we feed them, soothe them, burp them, etc. As they cry, their brain will be making those connections to know long term that when I cry, I will be soothed. And that will begin creating the attachment that we're saying is so important. And the child will actually start to show an obvious preference for their primary caregiver. Because guess what? They trust that you will answer their call. As Dr. Jean said, and I quote, they, de- they develop internal mental working models to convey that the world is safe. One last thing I'd like to note here when discussing why we shouldn't let a baby cry it out is, as Dr. Jean so appropriately offers, no one is perfect. No parent can be consistently at their baby's beck and call at all moments and all seconds of the day. And this is okay. But in reverse, or um, try to delete altogether this idea that babies will self-soothe. Likewise, as parents, it's impossible to completely prevent our children from experiencing unhappiness or difficult challenges. So I advise you not to let this be your goal. We're going to end today with a section within this chapter that Dr. Jean provides called What's a Parent to Do? She she shares four parental guidelines as presented by Claire Lerner and Amy Laura Dombro in their book called Bringing Up Baby. They, uh, they are guidelines for making good decisions in the first three years of a child's life. So the first piece of advice here is to become self-aware by asking yourself the following question, or questions rather. Number one, who is the parent I want to be? What is really important to me as a parent? What are my attitudes about parenting? What do I bring from my own childhood? What pushes my buttons? What is my temperament? What is the goodness of fit between me and my child and me and my partner? The second piece of advice is to tune into your child. So every behavior has a reason. What does this behavior mean to the child? Remember, our babies can't and will not manipulate us. The third piece of advice is to make sensitive and effective decisions. So manage your own emotional responses to your child's behavior. And the last one here is if you can't reflect about your dreams of parenting, examine your own childhood and see where some of your attitudes and views might come from. Seeing where behavior is coming from helps us to not respond reactively. As one example, upon um, reflection, a parent might ask or might think, you know, maybe that meltdown at the grocery store happened because my child is tired, not because I've screwed up as a parent. So at the end of the day, to really ensure secure attachment, practicing 
or you should practice getting into the mind of your child. Try to understand their emotions and their behaviors to be a reflection of what they feel in, internally because of the environment that surrounds them. So if you can do this, your child will start to feel connected to you in profound ways. Thank you for listening to chapter two summary of Love Builds Brains. Don't forget to join our Facebook group to receive exclusive book club content. If you're watching this from within the group, then I welcome you and can't wait to see what you do with the rest of the week's material. Bye for now.